So I have a confession this morning uh, to start out with as we begin working through this part of Revelation, that especially when I was younger, a little kid, uh, you know, I don't know when it quite started, but I was what you would call, I guess, a firebug. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed fire. I enjoyed playing with fire. I enjoyed anything that had to do with fire. Uh, I liked fire. And, and you know, the, my spirit animal might be Beavis and, and Butthead, you know, they're like, fire, fire. You know, but I enjoyed fire. And so, you know, growing up in the country, we always had fire going. We did everything with fire. We would cook with fire. We had bonfires all the time. We'd roast, uh, you know, hot dogs and marshmallows. All in Western Pennsylvania, we called them wiener roasts. I don't know about uh, what you call them here, but that's what we did there. And we did marshmallows and s'mores and mountain pies and all those things on, on with the fire. And, you know, we burned leaves in the fall rather than raking your leaves up and putting them in bags and putting them out for the trash. We didn't have trash that came in our area. We would just put them in the line and burn them. And you would spend all day Saturday burning leaves, and we would cut brush rows down and, and burn brush and things like that. And then when we would dispose of tires, well, that's a whole other story. We can't go on and go on record for what we did with the tires and everything else and the motor oil and how we got rid of all that stuff. But we everything we got rid of with fire. In fact, my parents to today, still today, have a, a burn barrel in their yard. Uh, where instead of placing their paper trash out uh, for, or their burnable trash out for the garbage man, which does come now, uh, we would put it into a trash can and we would burn it. And every day we were burning garbage uh, through our house. And so fire was always around. And so I saw plenty times when my dad would start a fire from a young age, how he started a fire, and what he used perhaps to get the fire going in all conditions. Because you never know what sort of condition you are going to get. So, which is to say about one day when I was Malachi's age, uh, perhaps when I was four, maybe five at the most, but uh, I was pretty young, uh, so Malachi's age, uh, my parents, it was the fall, were burning leaves. And they had a leaf pile. We had about an acre, an acre and a half lot that we lived on. And so mom and dad were outside and they were raking leaves into this pile. They're all dried up and we were burning them. And, you know, as a kid, there's nothing better than, you know, the seeing the leaves burn. And of course, somewhere in my mind, I got thinking that perhaps the fire should be bigger. It should be more impressive. And so I don't know quite how I worked it out. My parents have told me this story repeatedly, but uh, I know that mom and dad, for a moment, went inside the house. And, and just a side, a side note, like having kids now, like you, you, you know the, the, the kid that got into the gorilla cage at the Cincinnati Zoo, right? And everyone wonders, like, how did that kid get in the gorilla cage? Where was the parents? If you take your eyes off a kid for like a split second, they're like wherever that opening can take them. So, you know, I've been slow to judge in, in, in that case. My parents went inside the house where they could still see. They thought I was outside around the garage or somewhere running around, maybe perhaps in the sandbox, which would buy, be by the garage. And when they looked up, I was halfway between the house and the fire carrying or dragging a five gallon uh, bottle of gas, can of gasoline. I had got it in my mind that I had seen my dad use gasoline to start a fire. And when you put gas on wood or leaves or anything else, and you put that match to it, what does it do? It looks great, right? What could be better for a four-year-old kid than seeing that fire? Like, it was mesmerizing. And so I'm there. I think I was... Mom says I was still in a diaper, so maybe I was younger than four. Who knows? But I'm like trying to drag this gas can down. Now, obviously, it can't be too full. And so we get, I get down there. Mom comes running out of the house, chasing after me, yelling at me to stop. And they reach me just before I reach the fire with the gas. Now, I can tell you all sorts of other fire stories that I have, but I realize my own kids are here, and I don't want to give them any ideas, let alone your kids. So I will stop. If you want to know those stories, you can ask me later and about how I tried to make bombs all the time. So, uh, so anyway, mom and dad got me down, uh, down at the end of the yard, you know, almost an acre away. They ran after me, got me, uh, brought me back up to the house. And I'll, I'll just say that, you know, probably I didn't sit for a long time after that. You know, that, that there was a fire down at the bottom of the yard, and there was also a fire on my body as well. And that would not allow me to sit after they got done with me and trying to convince me about how, you know, I was making a really a not a very good choice. So my parents, out of their love for me, out of their love for me, disciplined me. They, they told me uh, and would not allow me to put myself in harm's way. My parents, out of their love for me, disciplined me and would not allow me to put myself in harm's way. 
The believers at, at Thyatira, the fourth stop on our tour of churches in Asia Minor, uh, are we read with them today uh, that they are commendable for several reasons. Jesus says through John in here that they are known for their faith and their service, uh, excuse me, their love and their service and their faith and their perseverance. They're known for their love, which comes out in the way they serve their neighbors and their faith, which reveals is revealed through their perseverance. They're also known, Jesus says, commended for that they are making improvements in the way they are showing not only their faith and perseverance and their love and service. They are showing that each and every day. They are making improvements with that. And so this is a good thing. I think if you are a believer, if you're a Christian, uh, I mean, even if you're in the workplace, like to have someone above you say, I see your improvements. Every day you're making improvements. You would feel pretty good about yourself and say, this is a good, this is a good, good thing. But here Jesus says, but I know your deeds. He goes, comes back and he says, but there is something, there is something I have a complaint against you. It's something that needs to be addressed. There, there's a problem. And so like last week, we talked about Balaam, this false prophet that was in the church at Pergamum, who probably wasn't really named Balaam, but it was like Balaam that he was, this prophet was leading the believers at Pergamum, Pergamum astray. We have someone else today. Jesus says that there is someone in the midst, a false teacher named Jezebel. Now, you know, we name our kids a lot of things. Jezebel's not really a name that's caught on. And there's good reasons that Jezebel is not a name that has caught on for naming our girls this sort of thing. But it, Jezebel, the name is to make us think back to the Old Testament. It's a reference to an actual person who lived. King Ahab had a wife named Jezebel. And this is the time of Elijah. And Jezebel was not a very good person. Jezebel led King Ahab astray. Jezebel had in her employment, she was the benefactor for 850 prophets of Baal. And if you were an Israelite, and especially if you were an Israelite king, as her husband was, you were to be separate from all these false gods and false idols. But your wife is the main benefactor for these prophets of Baal and otherwise. Jezebel, uh, when uh, Elijah came against her, and, and others, she went out and tried to kill him and other prophets of God. The prophets who were remaining went into hiding. Jezebel was not a nice, not a nice person at all. And part of what Jezebel is doing is teaching the believers there in Thyatira, like Balaam and Pergamum, is teaching the believers to commit both sexual sin and to offer to eat food sacrificed to an idol. Now again, commentators, like we said last week, go back and forth about whether this was actual physical sexual sin, which it very well may be, or that it is a spiritual adultery, which actually fits with the theme of Revelation. Either way, there is a prophetess or a female teacher, a woman teacher, in the midst of Thyatira who is leading the people astray in teachings that are different from the teachings of God that contain in the Old Testament and ultimately as John teaches them about Jesus. Because remember, they don't have the New Testament, right? They don't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. They're going off of the Old Testament. That's their scripture. She is teaching the believers there to compromise in their conviction. And here's the problem. The believers there are tolerating it. In the NLT, which we read, it says you're permitting. You're permitting something. They're allowing something that is contrary to the word of God, contrary to the teachings of God, to exist that shouldn't exist. They are tolerating. And they're le that's leading them into both sexual immorality, but also to mingling their, their Jewish and newfound Christian beliefs, and it's being permeated with pagan beliefs. And remember last week we talked about how each of these cities has uh, imperial cult temples there, the worship of the Roman Empire, the worship of, of the emperors and the leaders there. And so if you were to be a good Roman citizen and a good citizen in good standing, you worshiped Rome. You were very nationalistic. You worshiped your country. You worshiped the empire in which you were a part of. But also one of the problems that, that was there was the, uh, was the trade guilds, that if you worked in the local underwater basket weaving union, uh, that when you would gather for the underwater basket weaving annual meeting, that you would eat food sacrificed to whatever your patron deity was so that you would have a successful year underwater basket weaving. 
And so if you were a Christian who was called to worship no other God but Yahweh, to participate in that trade guild meant that you worshiped that God, at least participating in some way by being present. And so Jesus, through John, is saying that you have permitted this teaching to lead you astray, that you are focusing on teachings that are not part of the worship of God and not part of the worship of Jesus Christ as God's son. And so what Thyatira has is a tolerance problem. The church here has a problem of tolerance. They are tolerating a false teacher. They are tolerating a teaching that is contrary to the teachings of God. And so today, right, like, Tolerance is a loaded word today, right? It's, it's a buzzword that we have, whether uh, you are in a community setting, whether you're in an academic setting. Like tolerance is, is a major buzzword that we have today. And many places that we go, we're going to find and hear and listen that the key to moving forward is to have tolerance for one another. We're, to be, we're told and taught to be tolerant of other people's beliefs and their actions, even if they are different than our own, even if they're different from our own. I think it's important that we think about this, the, the city here and the church is what, what really is tolerance and what should we understand as, as tolerance and what's appropriate to tolerate and what's inappropriate to tolerate as Christians. A definition that we may work with is that tolerance is acknowledging that everyone is created in the image of God. To have tolerance for one another is acknowledging that each one of us is made in the image of God. And in Genesis, we're told this in the Old Testament, that God decided to make human beings in God's image. And that in God's image, that, that you and I and people in Africa and South America and Asia and, and wherever it may be, anything and any person that's created, we are created in the image of God. And being created in the image of God means that we have sacred value and sacred worth. And so what tolerance means is that we can disagree on any number of things, but because each person has sacred value and sacred worth, we will treat the other person the way we want to be treated. We will treat that person as if we are treating ourselves a certain way. And so from a biblical standpoint, this would be a, a, a biblical definition or a Christian worldview of what it means to practice tolerance. That someone who is different than us is still created in the image of God. And therefore, as Christians and people who are focused and centered on their life on God, we should treat them with divine, sacred value and sacred worth. That means that person that we see as the scum of the earth, they have sacred value and sacred worth. And we should still treat that person as... We want to be treated. We can disagree with that person. We can be diametrically opposed to the way they live their lives. But they still are created in the image of God. I think so many times we've got this wrong in the church. Especially in the American church. And even further in the white American church. That we forget that those who are different than us are created in the image of God, and we are called to treat them with sacred value and sacred worth. And so true tolerance recognizes that each person, regardless of race, religion, regardless of orientation, socioeconomic level, and ability, are created in God's image. And being created in God's image means that each person has value and worth, and that determines and dictates how we should treat one another. And as Christians called to bear the image of God in our lives, called to reflect the, the character and the nature of God and the way we live, if we treat someone poorly or treat someone differently than we want to be treated, if we treat someone as anything less than created in God's image, then we're not bearing God's image and we are missing our calling as Christians and as followers of God. Because each person has sacred value and sacred worth. This is the big problem with what's happening in Charlottesville. But it's not just Charlottesville, because that's just the microcosm of what's happening in our country. And you could probably even zoom out even further and say this is what's happening in our world. And what we see happening is not just a problem of race or ethnicity or socioeconomic standing. It is a sin problem. We have permitted sin 
to exist in our lives and in our churches where we allow ourselves to think that we are superior than other people. That if we each have sacred value and worth, because we're all formed in the image of the Creator, then we treat one another with sacred value and worth, and we treat others the way we want to be treated. And this is the challenge for us, I think, uh, to, to think about what it means to be tolerant. Because sometimes, and, and I come from a particular view uh, of, of things, both theologically and otherwise, like we hear tolerance all the time, and if you don't agree with someone, we get labeled a bigot or something else. I don't agree with that. Because we can, we can be of different minds, we can be of different political spectrum on different sides, we can be a, but we can still love and respect and treat one another with sacred value and worth. We may disagree, just because I have come, uh, you know, within the church, we have a certain set of standards that we live by, theoretically, uh, as we read through the teachings of Jesus and through the Bible, but, you know, it's very tough to apply those to someone who's not in the church. But we still treat that person with sacred value and sacred worth. And so when we see things of what's happened, and, and we need to name these things, like we need to name racist groups, that is evil and demonic and satanic. And so when we think of ourselves, especially as a predominantly white church, we allow ourselves to think of ourselves as better than someone else based on the color of our skin, or based on our ethnicity, or based on our socioeconomic status, or based on the fact that we're, that is demonic. And this doesn't mean we agree with everything that someone does, but it says that we still treat someone with love and respect because of sacred value and sacred worth. And this is one of those challenges, like there's people I would love to hate, okay, <laughs> you know? And, and there's people that I would think in my mind and I judge just like any, the next person that get what they deserve. Yet on the other hand, there's no person that is so far God that God can't redeem them. And so if we have written someone off, God never writes us off. God doesn't write guy that drove the car off into the crowd yesterday, God hasn't written that guy off from being redeemable. We look at what's happening with North Korea right now and the, and, and the ruler of North Korea. That guy is not beyond God's redemption. And the same people in our government, in many ways our own government is just as screwy on a state, national, local as what we see all around. Like We are not so far gone because God's desire is, is redemption. And so as Christians especially, we cannot write off people based on their actions or based on their beliefs or based on who they are and their lifestyle that we still treat them with love and respect because they have sacred value and sacred worth. And this is such a challenge, you know, because the scriptures tell us, you know, the first John says that if, that if we claim to love God yet hate our brother and sisters, then we are liars. We can't really be Christians. We can't even call ourselves that if we hate someone. Galatians 3.28 talks about how, you know, in Christ there's, there's neither Greek, Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. Because in Christ we set aside all those labels and say we are one in Christ. <coughs> Book of Revelation, the seventh chapter, uh, you know, John has this vision. We're in Revelation right now. John has this vision of what it will look like to be or surrounding the throne in heaven, to worship God. John says that in his vision, he saw every nation, tribe, and tongue, and kind of people surrounding the throne. It wasn't just white folks. It wasn't just Americans. The people from every nation, tribe, race, tongue, Surrounding the throne, worshiping Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about tolerance, we can have a disagreement. We can disagree on certain things, but what we cannot allow is for ourselves to tolerate hate. To tolerate putting someone else above other people. Because I have sin too. I guess as you do as well. And this is the thing, is like true love is intolerant. True love is intolerant. Think back to me carrying the gas can 
down to the fire. Now, my parents, I think, love me. Uh, pretty sure they do. Uh, you know, they, they gave me every opportunity to succeed in life. Um, but you know what they did when they saw me carrying that gas can down towards the fire? They yelled at me. They beat me on my way up. And they probably sent me to my room. And then when I came back out, they yelled at me again. Uh, because I put myself in danger. And if we truly love someone, especially in the church who were called to hold one another accountable, when we see attitudes and actions that creep into our church that are contrary to the teachings of Christ, then we need to hold one another accountable. Not in a hateful way. Not in an I'm better than you way. But a way that comes across, and we read Matthew 18 where he talks about how we should you know, go one-on-one -on -one first and then bring someone else that they still don't change and then talk about it amongst church leadership. But you know, there's an act of discipline. Because we love one another, we are intolerant of false teaching. We are intolerant of behavior that is contrary to who God is. And so in a way, love is intolerant. And so for the church at Thyatira, they were permitting a teaching, someone to teach things that are contrary to the gospel, contrary to the teachings of God. And what they really needed to do was rather than tolerate it, they needed to terminate the teaching. They needed to make sure that it didn't exist and not give it a platform. And I think for us, the same thing comes true is do we tolerate things in our lives that we should terminate? Do we tolerate things in our lives that we should terminate? Are there attitudes and action, attitudes and, and thoughts and, and actions in our lives that are contrary to the teachings of God? I'll admit this, like, and, and this is tough to do, but there are times and in certain situations where we can go to certain places, whether it's up to Philadelphia or someplace else, and I see someone that looks different than me, and there are times where thoughts come across my mind that are sinful. And those are attitudes and actions that need to be terminated. Or if I think of myself as better than someone else, those things need to be terminated. We need to cut them and get rid of them. My parents had fruit trees growing up, and uh, we had apple and peach trees in our yard. And, and of course, they, they took a while to grow, but especially our apple tree, uh, it, it, it produced some really nice apples for a while. And then as it grew, and as, the longer it went, the apples got smaller and smaller, and then they just became like little crab apples or whatever. They really weren't good for much of anything, except for throwing at my sister. That was always good <laughs> to do, okay? What, what needed to happen with the, with the tree was it needed pruned, right? That with a the, with the fruit tree, you have to prune it back so that the nutrients and the energy can go in and produce a fruit. You do this with peach trees. You do this with pear trees. You have to prune it. Uh, I learned that with rose bushes, that you have to deadhead the rose bushes once the flowers die so that new roses can grow. Here I thought it was something with the Grateful Dead and that roses like listening to the Grateful Dead and they're deadheads. But, uh, I won't tell that joke at 1130. They won't get it. So, uh, you know, but... You have to cut away what's dead in order for there to be new life. Are we tolerating what we need to terminate? And so today, I want to challenge you to think about your life. You know, we've changed our name to Orchard Church. Our, our vision, we need to keep saying this more but on, on a regular basis. The vision for our church is to grow deep, growing deep and branching out. And somewhere we may add this on here because the implication, we probably just need to state it and bear fruit, right? We have the image of a fruit tree. And so for, for me to be a fruitful Christian means that I need to prune areas of my life. I need to invite the Holy Spirit to prune areas of my life that are dead and dying so that I can be fruitful. And perhaps there's places in your life today where you need to do the same. To invite the Holy Spirit and say, what do I need to terminate so that I can be a fruitful Christian?
And so what is God calling you to terminate or prune this morning? What are the attitudes and actions that God, that are contrary to God? Because perhaps we've not experienced growth in our personal faith and our personal walk because we allow these things to exist. We tolerate them. And so what areas do you need to terminate or prune this morning? I want to pray for us and then we're going to uh, take a little, a few moments and we're going to pray uh, for not just Charlottesville but what's happening around our area because I think as Christians we need to make sure that we are intolerant of the hateful attitudes and actions and words that we see in places like Charlottesville but we see them in Dover too we see them in Magnolia we see them in other places around and again I, I, I've seen in, in so many places on Facebook this weekend because I get I go down the wormhole. I don't know if you guys go down the wormhole where you just click on articles and click on articles and click on articles and click on articles. And the question that keeps coming up is this. Chris said it. Something's got to change. The question I keep seeing is who's going to lead? It's got to be the church. And we're a predominantly white church. We cannot stand on the sidelines and expect someone else to figure it out. Christ has called you and I, has called our church and our churches to lead the way, to lead in love. It's messy. I don't quite know how to do it in a sense of other than you, we just got to start doing it. To be intolerant of hateful attitudes. We can disagree, but we can still love one another and see the value that someone else brings even though we disagree with one another. So I want to pray, and then we're going to have a time of congregational prayer. And if you need to come and you want to pray, Ben's going to lead after, we're going to sing a song after we pray together. But you know, the prayer rail's open, that if there's something that you want to come and both invite the Holy Spirit to prune, or if there's something that you want to pray for, we invite you to come and do that. So let's pray together. God, we give you thanks today uh, for your love and grace. We thank you, God, for this letter to the church of Thyatira. God, that you have called them to a higher standard to not tolerate a teaching that has permeated their church that is contrary to who you are and who you've called them to be. And so in the same way, God, allow us to be intolerant of false teaching, to be intolerant of sin, to be intolerant of hate, that we see the sacred value and the sacred worth in people around us, people who are different than us, people who believe differently than us, even people who make choices and decisions and who live a lives that we just don't understand, but help us to see that they are still created in your image. And that you call us as a church to be a church of love. And that it won't mean that we'll always agree, but that we'll show love to one another. God, if there, there is sinful behavior or teachings or attitude that creeps into the church, help us to hold one another accountable. And if someone comes to me, God, give me a spirit to receive it. Holy Spirit, come and prune the areas of our life that need to be pruned so that we can be fruitful Christians and a fruitful church.